are you aiming at a coherentist view of truth? You want to get people's beliefs aligned with reality and you have some concept of reality in your mind when you sit down and have a conversation with people that you're guiding people toward this particular view of reality? I'd love to ask a question about that question. Like if other people are using an epistemology to conclude things which are in fact false, could it lead to political problems for me? Well, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, I'm asking. Like, how would could ghosts? It, like, how it? would ghosts? How would ghosts affect legislation? Well, that's the thing. It's the epistemology that I'm interested in, not the conclusion so much. I want to know how they determine that their their conclusions. That I'm interested in how they got there, and if somebody is using something to get to another conclusion, I I'm wondering how that if that epistemology can lead to other things that could that could lead us in, into a dispute somewhere else, not unrelated to the belief, tangential so to- So I hear- some hummingbirds um i love may may is my favorite month of the year probably that's cool yeah. well that's good 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 yeah all right well um what did you think about our talk last time i sent you an audio file of our last conversation did you get a chance to listen to it no i don't usually go back honestly nathan and listen to anything i do i okay. uh, I don't even like listening to myself on the podcast that I produce. Right. Yeah. Um, I remember, I don't, I'm not specific. I mean, if there's something specific I said or whatever, but I, I don't like listening to myself. I don't like looking at myself on camera. I can't, I can't stomach going back and looking at things I did on YouTube, especially. It's just so kind of so self-conscious about that stuff. I just don't. But I, I have a I have a pretty good handle of how things went anyway um okay but uh i mean if you have something specific if i say something that you know it's a good reference but uh no i had this okay well, that's good to know um so like a a real big part of my practice with street epistemology is mm -hmm. informed consent that's a huge part of my practice and i'm speaking only for myself everybody else has their sure. own thing um and what informed consent means to me is like, I want to put things online after I'm done talking with people. Uh, and if I plan on having an ongoing relationship with them, I want them to uh, be informed about what I plan on posting before I do it so yeah. that they don't look at me later like I shed an, uh, them in an unfair light or anything. Uh, no, I understand. I understand. We don't do that with our book club. We don't uh, bring our guests on and we don't do. By the way, thanks. Of... Thanks for inviting me. That oh, was sure. really cool was... of you. Yeah, we don't. Um, but to what you're saying, we bring our guests on. Like we had Seth Andrews on uh, in November, I think. Seth was not gracious enough to come on. But uh, oh, you know, cool. we, told, we, we didn't agree. 90% of what he said was like, no, we don't agree with that. But yeah. We're not gonna. We didn't lure Seth on to, to gather information to turn around and make a review video of Seth's performance. We don't. We don't do that, and we wouldn't do that. Um, and so I understand. You know, guests come on in good faith, and they we say we're civil and we we mean that, and that means that we're not going to turn around and knife you in the back and make a, a, a critique video of your performance on our book club. We don't do that. Right. <laughs> right. That's not what I'm about either. I don't. I'm not to do that. That's why I, I like, like you. Me. That's why I want to talk to you too. Like honestly, I I, I really mean that. Um, did you happen to to catch a glimpse that I I 
after our last talk, uh, mm -hmm. I decided I wanted to make an SE criticism playlist for my channel. Yeah, I saw so that. that. I, did, I did respond to your tweet. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you like, for keeping keeping me in line with uh, if I ever step out of bounds or if anyone in the community steps out of bounds, it's good for me to examine what those critiques are so I can know not to do those things. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't made all Street of Piss Mall just happy. <laughs> right. So I was like, whoa, we made a whole list of all my things. Maybe he's just uh, setting up dartboards for everybody to throw at me. I don't know, but uh, no, I'm fine with that. You know, they're out there. I, you know, my, my only motivation is um, there's a lot of Christians you guys talk to that don't know the mechanics of this, don't know what drives it. You know, obviously right. we disagree about the atheism component of it, but I think my desire was to inform Christians and to say, here's what I think is wrong with this movement. Here's what I think is, is good about it. And then, um, right. you know, we're going to have our disagreements on those points, but I'm not out to, uh, to make anybody look bad. I mean, I had to focus on Anthony only because he's pretty much, you know, uh, brought it to where it is now, but I don't have anything against Anthony. I know in one of the critique videos that I did, um, I tried to show his a timeline of his own development. I know he said he's changed, and things have changed. I tried right. to be genial for that, and um, you know, but I can't. Uh, I, I really tried hard not to generalize about it, but I think there are some generalities about it that you can certainly say what makes SD what it is. But yeah, I don't well, hate it. I don't hate anybody. I mean, I'm I sure I do like either, it. and that's why I, I like talking to you. <laughs> I, don't I think have, you're. Uh, I think you're very. You you're charitable in many respects. Not in in my view. Not all respects, though. I'd say many respects, and that's why I like engaging with you. And one thing I wanted to mention that is different about street epistemology today, uh, not for every practitioner, but for many of us, uh, huh? is I keep hearing these labels like atheist and Christian, and like in my mind, when I sit down at my booth. I had to say, what do you believe and why? So like, mm -hmm. I, I'm not choosing the topics. Like people are coming with, with their topic, right? So I'm not saying like, mm -hmm. or I'm trying not to, and maybe I am subconsciously and I'm not aware of it, though I'm not trying to get people to tell me about their God belief at all or mm -hmm. any, any particular belief. I might have a list of things that I think I would like to talk about. And then mm -hmm. if my conversation partner chooses one, then that's great. Cause now that's extremely informed consent because I've consented and then now they're consenting to it. Now we can dig into it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, one regret I have from our last interview, cause I listened to it, not just once, like probably each day between the last time and today, I listened to it at least once a day to make sure that I, uh, wasn't unfair or the times in which I wasn't clear because <laughs> I'm, I'm not very clear. And I think clarity mm -hmm. is really my, my main priority, either clarity for you or for me or for us to bridge an understanding about what, where we think we're at. Um, and what was I saying about that? Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention was, uh, I forgot to ask you if there was something on that list that I sent you that you didn't want to talk about. Was there anything um, that's off the table or are all those okay with you to talk about today? They're fine. I, I thought it had a, um, um, let's just say, I'll just say it. I don't mean anything personally negative about it, but it, it did seem to conjoin a supernatural bias. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, an, an anti-supernatural uh, bias, uh, mm. but that would be my only criticism of it. You know, I mean, yeah. atheism should be on that list, right? Right. You think that that would be a nice uh, compliment to that? Well, I've noticed it, that, that. Yeah, sometimes... that's the thing. Like, you can take all. So all those, and and I might be wrong. Though in my head, each one of those are propositions. And yeah, and you could just and so they're all they can all be like p. <laughs> And you could just all take, you could just put not P in front of it. And then yeah, hold on just a second. I have to hold on just a second. I oh, please. Anytime something. that you need to take just, a break. That's fine. No, this is a, just take a second here. I just saw something about to happen. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. Never mind. 
I have stacks and stacks of things in here that are about to fall over, so. Oh, sure. <laughs> Working on See? lots of projects, right? You said you were doing like a... Yeah. Oh, wow, look That's, at that. My studio is behind there, and I have lots of things going on, and I have stacks and stacks of things that topple and fall. And <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. Um, what, what was the last thing I said? Oh. You were talking about uh, the list. Um, supernatural um, propositions, let everything be P, that kind of thing. Yeah, we could just put not P in front of each one of those. Sure. And that would be a sure. different, a different, would you agree, maybe you'd think about it differently. Would you agree that we could just make not in front of each one and that would be a claim in it of itself? Uh, oh yeah, its I, own, think, I think- With its own you, burden of proof? I think um, my, my personal take is that, uh, you know, I don't think atheism, is a worldview per se. Naturalism is a worldview that atheists embrace. But um, you know, people say, well, atheism is the question, is the answer to one question. Well, sure. Just like yes is you the see answer. It as to an one answer? Question. That's uh, interesting. Well, atheism is the answer to the question of does God exist? You know, so you huh. can answer that. Well, I'm you know, there's two ways you can answer that. You can that's say interesting. It's, it's I lack. think of it as a lack of an answer. Well, see, that's the thing, but that's an answer. So, so one answer could be, it's it's a lack. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I could say I don't. I, I lack a Ferrari, right? Is that an answer to the question? Do you have a Ferrari? I lack a Ferrari. I could say no. I, to me, it's like it's it's like I don't I don't like that definition. I'm not going to say that you can't use it, but that's I think it was Adolf Huxley who tried to coin that sort of to to avoid a burden of proof. But uh, I'm not saying you're unwilling to defend your position. I'm thinking that that is kind of like, so for, let's, let's set aside atheism for just a second. If, mm -hmm. you, if you are an atheist, you probably embrace some form of naturalism or physicalism or something like that, materialism or something like that. No supernatural agency involved. You know, I mean, some form of naturalism, if not naturalism, maybe if you're spiritual pantheism or something like that. I would say that the issue would be in a naturalistic claim. The other claim is, so like Graham, if you remember, he was talking about this uh, in the book, book, or Tim told Graham, kind of, I know they differed on this, but Tim said that naturalism isn't just one proposition that the natural world is all there is. There's a second tacit claim that there is no supernatural aspect to reality. And I think- Yeah, deserving I, its I agree own of proof. Him. That's correct, right? that's right. correct. So. Yeah. So we're not really talking about atheism there. So you might say, I lack a belief in God, or I believe there is no God. We can completely set aside atheism there and just deal with naturalism and the claim that naturalism entails that there is no supernatural reality. And so on naturalism, you would have that burden of proof. If you wish to say that atheism is just a lack of a belief, well, then you, then, okay, let's set that aside and let's just deal with naturalism as the worldview that you hold and deal with the claims within naturalism. I love this um, like abstract kind of way of describing uh, everything. It's really cool that you're putting it that way. Um, okay. Uh, so what did you want to talk? So I have some ideas in mind, though I'm more interested in what you're interested in following up. Do you want to pick up where we left off? Was there some direction you wanted to go? Did you have questions for me? Or would you like me to, to tell you what, I, what I, I would like to do? Oh, that's fine. We absolutely, I have no agenda whatsoever. I don't want to drive the train. I think just reflecting on last time a little bit, number one, I think this will probably be the not to not because I don't enjoy talking to you, but this will probably be the last time I can give this kind of time. Right, to right. This, um, I, I'm not closing our correspondence or anything. But, um, sure, for a while. I, I anticipate, yeah, I've got other people to interview too, so I hear yeah, you. Yeah, so I mean, that, I'm sure you understand that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so I, I'm, I, I, I knew you were clear on that. I just wanted to be clear. I, I don't have two hours every week to, <laughs> to do this. Right, right. Um, but that, <laughs> that's okay. I'm not totally understandable. In a way. And I'm not avoiding being interrogated by street epistemologists either. So people don't, people can make that. Hey man, I, I get it. I get it. Trust me. Anyway, so, so what kind of shifted for me a little bit, and this is just an observation. Uh, let's say this is just an impression. I'm not accusing you of anything. 
Okay. This is just an impression. So I tried to be like the guy who doesn't know anything about street epistemology. Because I am at that. Because you, you seem like some somebody who knows that you've, you've got breakdown videos and stuff. Well, what I'm saying is that it, it, that can be a disadvantage in a process like this. Hmm. And I can bring assumptions into the into play because I know what I kind of know what you're doing. So in What's one that? sense, I'm like, well, the the whole methodology, the whole idea of street epistemology, I I have enough of a grasp and a background of it to know. I don't mean like in a motivational wise, just on a technical, philosophical, psychological kind of way. I kind of know what's involved in what you're doing. Whereas if I was a total stranger to you and to street epistemology, I was trying to look at it that way, trying to analyze the way we, we converse. And I would think that if I just met you on a park trail in Portland somewhere, yeah. sat down at your table, started talking, and, and then, you know, the cameras, the questions, the surveys. Um, and then I'm like, well, what are you doing all this for? And you're like, oh, it's just, I'm just, I love talking to people. Well, okay. You know, but the, the kind of questions, the, the level of sophistication with the surveys, the, 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 the depth of questions, I'm thinking you're either a psychology major, you're writing a thesis, you're gathering, in, you know, you're doing a, a book research, or something like this. But to me, if you would have told me it was just sort of a hobby, I'd be like, what? That's a that's an interesting hobby, but it's it's really intense, right? So right. my hobby like, is other people's ideas. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dogging you for it. I'm not, I'm not right. making fun of you. I don't feel that way. Yeah. You're fine. But what to, to get to all that, I would say that my impression would be examining, looking at the list that you gave me, this, the list of spiritual things, uh, the, the nature of the questions, I would, I would get the impression at the end of it that you, that what's really driving your train is, is some kind of, some form of skepticism that you, you sort of want to, um, that, that just, just an impression. I tried to formulate in my head, if I have like no bias against street epistemology, I would get the idea that if I went back and I looked up street epistemology after our conversation, that you know, never having met you, and I looked it up, and I saw it was mostly in the atheist community, which it is if you Google it. It's it's you know atheists of this country, atheists of this group, mostly. this group, you know. And I would think, oh, okay, so Nathan was trying to get me to be an atheist. That's the way I would think. Now I'm not saying. Can I ask you a question I'm, about that? Sure. Do you, do you think that I'm imparting doubt just for the sake of imparting doubt? I don't know. That's that would be ascribing a motive. To you that I, I don't know. I mean, I, I take you at face value for what you tell me, but um, I think whether you're conscious of it or not, I think one of the, the factors underlying what you're doing is you you have a list of things that you think need to be people shouldn't believe these things, and you want to talk about them. I mean, your your banner video is about how to cause doubt, so it's like, is it? Wait, know, which one? Because uh, the, the banner, video, you have I think, for all my videos, something about is "Be something, the Open Mind You Wish to Encounter." That's that's like the. There's a title on. Uh, I think it's a black and white one. You're in your kitchen or something. That says something about teaching doubt or causing doubt or how to cause or how to oh, teach that's how a, to cause doubt. Yeah, how to instill doubt by. That, uh, that's right. That's what it is. Right, right. So I would I would add all that up and think. Okay, I don't know what your motives are, and I certainly so somebody was asking that. me questions about how to talk to their to their mom. About yeah. Them. So yeah. I, I'm giving you the like I'm pretending I don't know anything about your street epistemology. I would I would look at all of that, add it all up in the context, and think, oh, he was really just trying to get me to doubt my faith. That just seems to be what. Now I'm not saying I know you better. Uh, you enjoy talking to people. You nice and kind, and I'm not ascribing any ulterior motives to you or anything like that. But I think I think the overriding meta narrative for a lot of street epistemologists is is somehow in some way causing doubt, causing people to doubt in supernatural realities. Now I can I can span that beyond you know, okay. Christian theism, but it started with sort of attacking Christian theism. And I know it's morphed, but I still because it still lingers what would cause you to think that isn't what's I'm uh, I'm wondering what would it what would you need to see to think that that's not happening with street epistemology? Um, well, I, I think I, I think that, that a enough more open mindedness to to theistic ideas. So here's a great example of that, that I can give. 
Um, I've heard many times in the videos I've watched people I've talked to, and maybe you again said it to me. I don't know if you did. I can't remember if you said it to me in our conversation or not, but this idea that, well, you know, I want to believe as many true things as possible. And if you have the truth, I want to know it. Yeah. Well, okay. So I hear that a lot, right? However, I've never seen a street epistemologist concede an ounce of any truth that would be emanating from a theistic worldview when people are trying to make points about God or Christianity or the spiritual world or supernatural. I don't see SE conceding anything even remotely valid about the supernatural reality, about the possibility of supernatural reality. So it's like what it seems to me, and I'm not saying you're doing this, right? but what I see is like, I want to be open to as many true things as possible. And if you have the truth, I want to believe it. But in the back of many people's minds, it's like, I don't want anything to do with supernatural. I've already written that off. And, but I'm going to say this maybe to open up the person to get them to communicate. Because if you have a willing interlocutor who feels comfortable with you, you can say, I want to believe the truth. If you have it, I want to hear it. But if you're saying in the back of your mind, I want nothing to do with the supernatural, I've already written that off, mm. um, then, th then there's an issue. So I can't say that, that I'm not saying that's what you're doing. But if nobody ever concedes even a remote possibility of the supernatural being, being true, then that statement, the more you hear it, the more it kind of rings hollow. Well, you know, so that list that I sent you of all the claims, like mm -hmm. I had numbers prepared that I was going to send you. <laughs> Uh, though, so uh, to like, to kind of give you an image of where my confidence is in those things, though, mm -hmm. um, sometimes like practitioners think that that's not a good idea to do that only because it biases our IL, it biases our conversation partner. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, and we're trying to remove our bias from the conversation sure. that we're trying to. And so that way we can learn or try to learn for like seek out the reasons somebody's using to believe in whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. And this can go for political things too. And I, oh, yeah, you were absolutely. talking about my degree earlier, it's political science. Right. Uh, right. Though I was going for a psych degree. Uh, I didn't get, I didn't finish it. Um, though, um, yeah, okay. So I, I think I, I think I hear you out. Like what I'm hearing you say is, uh, by and large, SE very well might be a community of people that are uh, essentially saying that there is no such thing as the supernatural or that we can't, that we, um, that we're denying that there is a supernatural. Is that kind to of- be, uh, To be used Bogosian's words, doxastically flows to the supernatural. Oh. Um, it seems- and, and I'm not I'm not indicting every because yeah, yeah. I've said it many times. Can you tell I've me what you speech. think that means? Doxastic closure. Yeah, from Bogo now Bogosian says it in his book. I think it's the first book. Um, he thinks it's a weird term, and I agree. It's a little, it's a little strange. He seems to use it as an epithet, like it's not a compliment if you're right. doxastically closed. He seems to sort of use it as a, a pejorative, and what, what do you much, think? I don't. What do you think it means? I think it's a pejorative that he intended as a pejorative insult to Christians who won't change their mind. What does it now, mean? It means you're closed-minded to anything. And I think that's the way he and James used it in Impossible Conversations, in the same sense that uh, closed-minded people, um, as if being closed on something is inherently unvirtuous. Like, there's nothing... We could be closed about things intellectually. There's nothing wrong with that. It's never established that being closed-minded is a bad thing. I think it's good to be closed-minded on how to drive safely. Right. Um, you know how much alcohol you can handle, or whether or not you should date that person, right? Um, or how much money you should give to this person, or if you should do drugs, or you know whatever. There are tons of things that it's perfectly reasonable to be closed-minded about, mm -hmm. and so it's never really established in those two books that being closed-minded is a bad thing. Um, to me, it, 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 as you asked, to me it looks like a derogatory, pejorative term for people who are theists, who believe in God and will change their mind. Do like you the, think that if I were not confident in one of those beliefs on that list that you said you were confident in, if I could not provide anything that would make me confident just like you, would I be open-minded? Uh, 
say that again. I'm not sure I'm following you. Yeah, so that that list of claims that I gave you, um, and you wrote confident, not confident. And if I took the mm -hmm. opposite position on any one of those claims, and I could not provide something that would draw me to your understanding, like basically, if I just outright say, nothing will make me confident in this thing. Uh, would I be open minded? I have no idea. Because really, you're asking me to get inside between your ears. Right. And um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, you're telling me like Peter and Jesus, Luke 22, right? Peter denies Jesus. Peter says, uh, Jesus says, you know, this night you will deny me. Uh, Peter's like, Lord, I'll never deny you. I mean, 100% confidence, right? You want to use the numbers. Um, and, and later, Jesus, you know, is Peter denies Jesus three times. And so it humbles him. But, you know, we're not aware. Uh, we're not aware sometimes that we're probably, uh, you know, maybe if you're, you're willfully, whether you're willfully closed-minded, whether you're unintentionally ignorant or willfully closed-minded, I don't have the capacity to probe a person's mind to be able to differentiate between whether or not you're being willfully stubborn or whether or not you're just, you what know, do you you're think? just real. What, what do you think would make uh, this is so this is a hard, hard question. And if you'd rather pass on it, I totally understand because it's difficult, though. What what does make someone open minded to anything? Uh, humility, uh, uh, suffering. Um, and, you know, this I joking. I don't know what this means, but it's kind of a little phrase I have in my head. The school of hard knocks has no doorbells. You know, you just get the pounding on the door and um, humility, suffering, personal experience, life experience, uh, the more you learn, the more you suffer, I think the more you're willing to listen to other people. Um, and so mm -hmm. I, I really think that that uh, softens. It's not a guarantee that suffering is going to yeah. change your mind, but uh, it will soften you. And um, right. I know in the, in the things that I have suffered has, has taken the edge off of my attitude a lot of times uh, in the past. And so um, I've been a jerk of a teacher to students. I've been a, I don't have very good relationships with, I've never been married. I don't, I don't date very well. And, you know, I'm, I have issues that I struggle with that uh, um, make it, make me less likely to, to lash out at other people, right? Because I, I certainly could get the lion's share of tongue lashings from people I've hurt. And so, you know, through suffering, you you mellow out a little bit and you're more willing to be open-minded about things. Right. I like everything that you just said. And I, I think it shows that you're willing and capable of being uh, open with me about the way that you think. And I really respect you for that. Um, I'm wondering, since I don't want to uh, have a interview that goes on all day and a survey interview can take uh, some time. It could be like an hour and a half or so. It depends on who I'm talking to. Sometimes it could be like 20 minutes. <laughs> it just depends on the speed of it though. Um, how interested are you in doing, going through the survey with me? Cause I don't wanna impose it on you though you went to my survey uh, workshop and- um, They sent me to your survey workshop. I they sent actually, you, yeah, they sent yeah, you. I told them to put me in whatever room you wanna put me in. Right. So there I was, but, okay. uh, but now there's two things with the survey. Number one, I've taken it twice. And both times I've taken it very quickly, but the second time was informed by the way you went through it the first time. So if you, so I would say, I would, I would suggest oh, that any differences are, you know, largely in part because I've heard you explain the majority of those things the other night. Well, and so you got a speed that, run version of it. And really like the way I see it is the way I set up a survey interview these days um, is I give them the survey, they fill it out. And then I say, uh, you know, provided they want to go through it with me and they're open to being respectfully challenged with questions about it. Um, and I tell them all that's entailed in it and that it can unravel some ideas that we have and some ideas will get stronger in our head. It may change our minds in some way and I don't control what that is. Um, and uh, the way I set it up is, to me, it's like, imagine we're going, is there an art museum in your town? Oh, yeah. Or anywhere near Fort your Fort Worth has a lot of good art museums. They have a modern museum, uh, Museum of Modern Art. We have uh, the, um, 
Oh gosh, no. Forgot that they're beautiful museums. Okay, um, well, just get a know. picture in your head of like that museum, and just imagine I'm walking through that museum with you. And each one of these statements on the survey uh, are things that we street epistemologists often hear when we're doing an interview with somebody on a list of one of those claims that I sent you. So, like, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I sent you, I can't even remember how many it is, like 15 or something, maybe 20 uh, things. And we hear people say they're like beliefs about beliefs. They're, they're beliefs about how we form beliefs, which to me is like a very amateurish way of saying epistemology. Um, uh, they're what I believe about how I believe stuff. And um basically I to me a survey interview is us walking through an art gallery together and you're looking at a painting and I'm looking at a painting and it while it's the same painting for both of us we're interpreting what it is very differently and my goal is to put myself into your shoes to see the world through your eyes and to look at that painting together with you and I want to know how you view it. And then- Now, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, I was just gonna say, and then what I wanna do is say, if we change this word, how would you look at this painting? If we change this or that, how would it be different? What do we see in the painting and what, uh, what exists within the painting and what can we imagine exists outside of that painting if we were in the world of the artist, right? Putting our- My question would be, if we just met on a park and you're walking me through this list and we're having this chat for the first time, first time meeting you, first time talking to you. Now, I would take, you know, a girlfriend to an art museum. Sure. And we, she would, I would understand her motives for wanting to understand why I would think the painting means this or that. But I'm going to ask you immediately, why do you want to know such depths of my thinking about those things? And that gets us back to motives, which I'm not going to judge your motives, but what is the final goal? And this seems to be the kind of ambiguous layer of street epistemology. And I'm not saying you're guilty of this, but what, what is the final goal for this? Do you, do you view it as like your interlocutor doesn't really know uh, and I'm going to help them know? Are you like... Mm, are, do you're you, asking do you, really do you, good you, questions. And I well, I asked, this, a great I asked this in a couple of videos, you know, and one yeah. response was, you know, I asked, uh, generally, I wasn't talking to anybody, but I said, what, what, what's the right epistemology? Are you, is street epistemology trying to get me to, to, to accept a certain epistemology? Is it trying to get me to, mm. what's That's the question. final goal of you asking all of these hard questions? Because I, I told a friend of mine, I said, right. I know you're a- uh, you I'm dying to philosophy. answer this question. Can, but, can I answer it? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Um, to me, it's clarity. Though I could be wrong and think that my motive is something alternative to clarity, though I aspire for my goal to be clarity. If my goal isn't clarity, that makes me wonder what it is I'm doing. And what do you mean what by I, clarity? What I wanna do is bridge a gap of understanding. So like I'm over here and you're over here and I want to understand the way you see the world. Now you could make your own survey if you wanted, and I would be happy to go through it with you. Um, or, and we don't even need to do the survey. It, it's, I'm only throwing this out there because you make uh, critique videos. I'm about to release a ton more content. And should you decide you want to critique one of my videos, which I invite you to do, by the way, um, I would love to see how you fill it out first or how you would do it or, or how, especially because uh, one thing that made me really feel like you could relate to me was when you said you wouldn't hold it against anyone personally for believing in something like vampires or mermaids. Uh, you would Not want to sit no. down and, and respectfully get to know how they knew it, right? But there would be a, there would be a, um, like if I'm on an airplane and we're going to Chicago, I've got two hours to fill and they want to talk. Well, okay. Yeah. So, but with SE, the, the issue always for me, for me, 
Mm -hmm. is there's always a sort of veil or ambiguity behind this. You get down to bedrock and there's these terms that sound specific, but they really are kind of non-specific. So for example, you said clarity. And to me, when I hear that word in regards to me asking what you're doing, clarity in terms of, of what? Are you coming to me and, and thinking that you are how we... sharpening my fuzzy thinking? Do you think I need your help? In other words, I'm not, I'm not being pedantic here. I'm just throwing out questions. Do you, do you see yourself as someone who has the, the perspicuity and the intellectual clarity that someone who believes in ghosts does not? Is that what you're just trying to clear up their head fog? Or do you really want to know if there's ghosts or not? You know what I'm saying? So are you striving I really for clarity? really want to like, know if there's ghosts. Well, like, do you have this because i know you guys talk about it i also want to know how other people think about how they know there that there are or aren't especially if right. somebody says that they can know that there aren't <laughs> so so right. do you exactly so do you have uh you, you operate under a standard of objective truth and you go after certain claims with a standard in mind mm -hmm. and so to me i know you know philosophy so are you aiming at a are you aiming at a coherentist view of truth you want to get people's beliefs aligned with reality and you have some concept of reality in your mind when you sit down and have a conversation with people that you're guiding people toward this particular view of reality i'd love to ask a question about that question like if other people are using an epistemology to conclude things which are in fact false could it lead to political problems for me well what do you mean by that exactly well, I'm asking. Like, how would, would it, ghosts, like, how it? would ghosts, how would ghosts affect legislation? Well, that's the thing. It's the epistemology that I'm interested in, not the conclusion so much. I want to know how they determine that their their conclusions. That I'm interested in how they got there, and if somebody is using something to get to another conclusion, I I'm wondering how that if that epistemology can lead to other things that could that could lead us in, into a dispute somewhere else, not unrelated to the belief, tangential. So to I, hear, I hear you saying that, I, I hear an underlying assumption that you think there, there would be an epistemology up, upon which everybody could agree. Are you suggesting that, that, that that's I think, your, your I aim? Think, right. Is finding an epistemology where nobody disagrees? I think it starts you, with, asking and being open to being wrong and and that's what i'm trying to do and that's what i'm striving for so like if i'm not being the open mind i wish i would would meet me <laughs> then i'm not being fair uh and I'm, like in um like like let's take science uh cosmology there's a lot i'm not won't get technical here but, but the idea that that you can use the same methods do the same calculations come up with the same formulae but you can disagree about different things so i don't as 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 one who is who has heard you, I, I, I am unaware philosophically that there is an epistemology out there where there would not be a variance of different conclusions where people use the same method to come to widely different conclusions. So what I, what I hear you saying is you're sort of after a method that, that, that basically has no, uh, that doesn't arrive, allow people to arrive at different conclusions. And, and so I, I'm, I'm hearing that maybe you think that there is a method that's not going to be Debatable? Is that what you're striving for? So these aren't things that I'm saying. I I don't think. Um, well, when you like when you say you're looking for something like you're you're concerned about an epistemology, a method that might lead people to different conclusions. And I don't know of an, an epistemology that doesn't do that. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't know if I could give you even you know, with the best minds out there, even Christian philosophers or atheist philosophers. Are you saying that we won't be able to, even if we try, we won't be able to understand each other? Is that what I'm hearing? No, no, no. I'm not saying we won't be able to understand each other. I'm saying that what I heard you say was that you, you're concerned about methodologies that lead people to different conclusions. And I'm saying that I don't know of a methodology that doesn't lead people to distinctly different conclusions about things. Because we can, because Graham and, and, uh, and Tim came to widely different conclusions, but they're using the same philosophical terminology, basically. So is, 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 is the philosophy the problem? Or what's, what's underlying, what's, what's causing the difference? Is it the method? And is there a method where there isn't disagreement among human beings about 
the conclusions that we arrive at. Because mm -hmm. two people can look at Hubble Space Telescope data and draw distinctly different conclusions about it. And so I'm not sure that the goal would naturally be, I, I agree with you that understanding another human being is, is absolutely, it's a noble goal. That's why I applaud street epistemology, that's great. But I'm not sure that you can actually obtain a flawless methodology where nobody disagrees about it. You know, like what's the method? Right, that, and if you and I disagree disagrees. by the end of this, I'm gonna be okay with that. <laughs> yeah, that's fine, disagreement is fine, but yeah. the quest for the, the, the alchemic, the alchemy quest for the perfect epistemology, I think is, is elusive. I don't think there is one in which- Do you hear you know, me saying that? Do you think I'm saying that? I hear street epistemology kind of saying that because it lets back up to the history of this. The word faith is really was what Bogosian you know, hated. He hated that definition of faith. And so that's why he wrote a manual for creating atheists. And so I've heard Anthony say, and I don't know how, how he's matured beyond this, but I've heard Anthony say that um, you know, he uses faith. Well, look, the, the Muslim can use faith. The Christian can use faith. The Jew can use faith. The Mormon can use faith. Uh, the Hindu can use faith. So maybe faith is a faulty epistemology because look at all the different conclusions people come to who say they use faith. Well, let's transfer that into to other areas. I don't think faith is an epistemology. It's not a philosophy. Did you call um, faith an act last time? Faith is a, is an, is an, is a belief in action. That's the best way. I think that's a, a, a generic New action. Testament. Yeah. So when you're you, you, thinking about faith in your mind. So again, I'm not trying to corner you. I really am not. I'm oh, that's fine. In the way. It's all right. So if you want to, that's fine. Hopefully. I don't um, care. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, is it an, in your mind, is it a noun or a verb? Well, you can be both. You know, the, the Christian faith would be the noun, right? And then I, I take a step of faith and move to Texas because I believe Jesus wants me to go to Texas. Okay, so, so it can be both. So I think you, you can be both, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But my, my, my verb this, version. This is why is, we, and so like, this is why I don't ever presu presume to know what the word means when other people use it. I want to know what other people think the word is as they're sure. using it. Um, absolutely. If it's a verb or an act, then I would imagine it's something, it would be an epistem. Would you, would you say it is an epistemology when it's a verb? No, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's an action. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, you, you take what you already know, you act in light of the evidence. Now it's not exhaustive evidence, right? Faith still requires uh, taking a step of faith. When I moved to Texas in 20. That would be a verb. I, yeah. I, I didn't have all the all, all my marbles in a row. God didn't outline to me in great contractual detail what, why he was asking me to move to Texas. But me and many other friends were like praying and I need to move to Texas, sell my house in Tennessee, move to Texas. It was a step of faith based on the circumstances, prior knowledge, scripture, every other thing, except God coming down to me in a bright light saying, move to Texas, right? So I had to take that step of action given the sufficient evidence that i had in the community of believers to take that to take that act now the knowledge was already there right i had enough knowledge to act and so that action was is faith i have this knowledge i have this body of evidence and i'm going to act in light of that but now the knowledge came to me you know various different ways i was reading praying fellowshipping interacting with people relationships and you know jobs circumstances situations finances all of these things factored into that to that decision so so faith is actually the action itself packing up the car driving you know finding a place doing all that stuff and and that's how i perceive it i think that's how it's represented in in hebrews 11. now you could take augustine or i think it was augustine or anselm um i'm bad with church fathers but uh, faith, uh, I forgot how he defined it. He's, either of them said something like faith desiring to know. So, so there's a, so you take a step of faith in order to know more about God. Now that doesn't mean you're, you're just acting in light of no evidence. That means that, so for example, if I want to get to know you, Nathan, a simpler example here, I have to trust you, right? I, if you're lying to me, I have, I mean, I could do a, a journalistic investigation of your background if I wanted to, but um, I would have to, in order to have a, a relationship with you, there has to be an element of trust. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe a word right. you're saying. This is why if I transgress on, uh, on 
you or something that you say and make a video of you that doesn't treat you fairly, I would. Oh, I'm not worried about that. Like the, it was on me that the trust was broken. Uh, so I imagine that, you know, like you said prior, like we don't need to be doing this every week. <laughs> uh, though like no. maybe like six months from now, you make another video. I want, I really sincerely want to be able to reach out to you and and maintain that level of trust and say like, hey, I'm open to criticism in person if you wanna talk about it. I wanna leave the line of communication open. That to me is more important than anything else. Sure, and I, you know, I've had if a lot that, of people- If make... that breaks, I've truly failed, right? Like if, well, if for some reason this, the line of communication breaks, that to me is, my bar for failure like i've failed at that point if you yeah, were i don't, I don't to you. i'm not saying that you're giving me reason to distrust you i'm saying no right right, me, right we're just talking about trust in it, yeah in general yeah. Like, exactly that, that that is a bedrock uh, right any kind of knowledge right if i don't trust my teacher i'm not going to listen I'm not going to learn if i don't trust right. rush limb I'm not going to listen to anything he has to say. If I don't trust Billy Graham, if I don't have a trust there, right? Uh, it, you know, then then there's there's really it's it's going to be really difficult for any learning to take place. Now, right. if you thought I was just some Giacomo, you wouldn't learn anything from me, you know. <laughs> and I've been a jerk to kids as a teacher, and I'm sure there's fifteen, there's twenty and thirty year olds out there who I taught in elementary, middle school right now going. Mr. Ray in middle school, I hated, you know, um, because I was not, I didn't, I, for whatever reason, I didn't trust the person, you know, um, you're not going to have a flourishing marriage without trust. And so knowledge requires, I mean, you asked a good question of Tim of the book club. What's the difference between belief and knowledge? Thank you. Well, um, I think one of the underlying components is whether it's a belief or whether it's knowledge, underlying both of those is a foundation of trust. You don't trust, you're not going to know. I really don't think it's impossible to know. Right. Yeah. Um, we want to, we're, we're questioning whether or not we trust the methods we use to arrive at our. Right. Company. You have to. And, and so this is the other thing about the, the emphasis on methods that I share with people. I had somebody on Twitter today asking me the very, so how, what method did you use to know that Jesus is God? Yeah. And I told him, I said, I knew nothing, zero about Christianity at 25 years of age. Nothing. I never flipped a page of the Bible. And before I'd read anything in Genesis or anything in the Bible, I had two convictions as a 26-year-old that I was asking for, seeking, or looking for, that the Bible was the word of God. And Jesus was God. Okay. I wasn't looking for that. I didn't want to be a Christian. I wasn't looking to be religious. But the guy kept asking me, well, well, no, 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 no. What method did you use to determine that Jesus was God? And I'm like, look, man, I didn't do anything. I, I, I didn't have a tool. I didn't have a method. This was as much out of my control as it was me trying to prevent the sun from rising. I, I had these convictions at the age of 25, and I didn't know what to do with them. Like, where is that coming from? So I didn't, I didn't have a method of how I first came to understand who Jesus was. And so I think, Nathan, that, that that emphasis in street epistemology of methodology. Was your method the Bible? No, I didn't read the Bible. I had these convictions before I read the Bible. I didn't know anything about the Bible. Oh, fact, wow. You started believing fact, before you read the Bible. Right. Okay. And, and no explanation as to, to how, really. I mean, I went to church with a friend of mine at the time, but I wasn't really interested in church i was just more interested in her if but it weren't for I was, church would you have discovered it would you have, I have discovered no idea it? i i don't know Nathan. i mean i i i have no other explanation other than i tell people simply and purely jesus told me those things the spirit the holy spirit gave me that conviction right. and um i i didn't so i like, didn't do anything so there's no so let me just wrap up here and then you can have at me but the, the idea that in street epistemology, when you're talking to theists, and this is just something helpful to keep in mind, because I don't know, were you raised a Christian? Were you, would you ever have any religious background? 
I mean, I was informed. Uh, I wasn't brought to church. I was informed okay. and I did read the Bible. Yeah. Okay. No, I, so uh, I wasn't really raised uh, to be Christian or anything. So it would be weird, not totally weird, but kind of odd if somebody were to ask me or, or if you ask a husband and wife, what method do you use to know that your wife loves you? Right. Now it's, it's kind of a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a I did this last question. time. I remember this because I yeah. listen back it's to our not, conversation every day. It's not a wrong question. It's just odd because we odd don't question. think of love and relationships in terms of methodology. Because here's what implies when I hear the word method. I okay. think of a, com a computer, a piece of technology, a car, um, you know, how to function in a laboratory or how to do geology in the field. Um, what's the best best method for, for making pie or stew or baking or cooking or exercising or swimming or running, you know, things that have a technical enterprise to them. Like people that are athletes have a method about how they improve their athleticism, right? There's, there's certain methodologies that will enable you to build muscle and be a better athlete and endurance and all this stuff. So but when it comes, when it comes to relationships and God is a relational being, I, I, I think it's an unnatural question to ask of a relational context, what method you use to get to know somebody. Because we don't, our, our relationships are organic and multifaceted. Could you and they're ask not, me they're not push a, button. Could you ask me a question about how I know some about how I know a person I know? Sure. How do you know a person you know? Well like do you think I wouldn't be able to answer that question? No, I'm just saying that that would you would you look at it like a recipe or a technical how to fix your car? I mean, I'm telling you how I hear the word method when somebody asks me, what method did you use? Like I, I, if I go out on a lot of dates with somebody, is that a, is that a method to get to know someone? It might be. I don't know. Is that it, what you, it, is that what you're I'm trying to understand what you're saying. Yeah, well, OK, so let's take dating. Anyway. That's, a, that's a good idea. There's a lot of dating apps out there. I have a friend. Right, that'd be a method of finding someone. Right, and okay. so he has he has dating app anxiety, self-described. He goes out, he meets somebody, he uses the app like, like everything else, like Amazon. He puts a girl in his cart, he calls her up, they go out <laughs> on a date, they have a couple of dates and the weird question comes up. Right. Um, are you all still on the app? It's like, I'm, I'm enjoying the date. Are you gonna delete your app now? Well, no, okay. I'm a successful, you know, so, so you see that you see that's a, a good example of the confluence of a technique versus a relationship that we treat people. We, we, we app people, right? Uh, I mean, that's kind of social media. We, right. we put, we so go Daniel, shopping for a spouse. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to, I'm going to use a bathroom really quick and put oh, this sure. on pause. And then when we come back, um, I'd love to either pick up, take this wherever you want to take me, because I'm really just here to listen, uh, or we can talk about the survey or not doing the survey, or maybe you can give oh, me more, more critiques uh, to be a better street epistemologist. All these are good ideas, and I'll be right back. All right. Two minutes later. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, not a problem. I just want to step um, away for a minute. Okay. No, to, to finish up my thought. Okay. To put it to very to sum it very quick to sum it up very quickly. Most Christians, and this is just my thinking, and if you talk to theists, most Christians will view their relationship with God as a relationship. So it's like the difference between if I were to ask you, I could we could talk about it. I'm sure we'd agree on most points. There's a difference between a relationship and technology. You would say. Like a tech piece of a computer, we relate to our machines differently than we relate to people. We relate. If I hit my keyboard and do certain things on my video editing system, it's going to do the same thing every time because it's input gets specific output. And I think because of our technology, we have grown accustomed to treating each other like machines, like getting things out of people that we want, as we talked about manipulation last time. Um, but I think the 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 nugget, and this goes really down deep into where 
I, if I had more time to to really do a, a philosophical critique of, of epistemology. Well, that's what the survey the, I think is. Yeah, the 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 uh, what we, what we'd find at the basement, I think, is this idea that that uh, that the assumption of street epistemologists, if you want to go back to Bogosian, is that a, a Christian's relationship to God is like a Christian's relationship to his computer that you just put in certain things and you get a certain output. And, and you, you talked about dating. If you go out on several dates, you would be a Giacomo. If you said the same thing to, to a, a, a different girl every time you went out, you'd pick up lines, right? It's like, hey, this is a pickup line that works all the time. A girl can slap you in the face if you try to do that, right? You, you have to take each individual case by case because relationships are different than computers. Not all girls are the same. Not all street epistemologists are the same. Not all Christians are the same. And so when you ask a theist for the method by which they come to know God, I think it's, it's sort of conflating, and maybe you're not even, people aren't even aware of this. I think it conflates relationships with technology. I don't, I don't say, what are the methods by which I know my mom loves me? You know, I, I would say I could give you clues about why I think my mom loves me, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use method to describe it. It's much more organic and holistic than, okay. than sort of machine and technology language. So I think the difference is relationships versus the technology, two different things. And when you're asking me about my relationship, I think sometimes the language of technology comes into play and it's misguided and misplaced. It's the wrong uh, trope. It's the wrong metaphor for dealing with people's relationship with God because God's not an ATM machine. He's not a car engine. He's not a push button computer. He's not a laptop. Um, and so he, God is multifaceted. He has revealed himself in a multitude of different ways. Would you, people. Would you agree that this God that you believe exists also exists for me? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So like, that's, I mean, I hear you. I hear that. So like, I want, so I'm, I really, what this is, is it's curiosity on my part. And again, informed consent is the name of this game for me. And I want to know how you know that it exists also for me and so so i can know it exists because i want to know it exists if it exists is that is well, that let me okay ask you, well, can i do that absolutely it's okay well let me ask you a quick question my questions by the way are not so what i have in mind today was going to put every single claim to the side and not talk about it i was gonna i was asking i was gonna want to know like what how do you view certain words like what is truth, uh, all these different things. And uh, on the server, so like, let me show you here what I've got. I put a link in the description um, so you can take a look at- Oh, in the chat? Which one? This is the, whoops. Oops, stop share. Hold on one second. There it is. Yeah, in the chat is just like w how we filled out this survey last time and here here it mm -hmm. is and so like okay i'm not here to attack your views as a matter of fact oh, i know i don't even i'm what i was hoping to do was and we don't need to do it today we don't need to do it ever if you don't want to i was just wanting to go through and say how do you view number one and then i was just going to listen to what it is that you had to say and then I was going to ask you questions to better get to know you about it. And then I was going to do that for every single one of these. And I was going to be open to you asking me questions about it, too. That's what I have in mind. Well, we could do that if you want. Whatever you want to do. It's fine. So whatever you want to do. Okay.